شكرا لقناة 24 لمواكبة هذا الحدث اللي يعتبر مهم في المشهد ليس فقط الاقتصادي والاجتماعي فحسب بل المشهد اللي تمثله المملكة والثقل المهم اللي تمثله المملكة على المستويين الإقليمي والعالمي السينما تعتبر أحد الوسائل المهمة لكي تنهض بأصورة المملكة أولا وأخيرا من خلال نهوض صناعة السينما السعودية ومن خلال متنفس للأفلام السعودية في صالة السينما نعم سيد المحسن الآن صالات السينما أو دور السينما أصبحت واقعا كما شاهدنا أنتم الآن السينمائيين على المحك وأمام تحدي كبير والمجتمع في عالم السينما والمشاركات السعودية في المحافل الدولية تم مؤخرا قبول فيلم الأستاذ عبد المحسن المطيري الذي يحمل عنوان فتاة داعش في المسابقة الرسمية لمرهجان فليكس السينمائي وذلك في مدينة فيلادلفيا في بولاية بنسلفانيا الأمريكية ويحكي الفيلم قصة سيدة تقرر الانضمام لداعش في مهمة سرية وصعبة من أجل تخليص صديقتها التي خطفها داعش وتم تصوير الفيلم الروائي القصير في الولايات المتحدة وللحديث أكثر حول هذا الخبر ينضم معنا هاتفيا المخرج السينمائي الأستاذ عبد المحسن المطيري هذا عبد المحسن هلا حياك الله استاذ عبد الكريم الله يحييك طاقه شرعيه تماما ومظله من النظام الايراني فالقضيه مش القضيه ان كيف ان كابي بيست لا طبعا انا ضد الكابي بيست بس انك كيف تفهم انت كيف تركب قصص معينه ما تخليها مباشره يعني افلام على الحد الجنوبي ابطالنا في الحد الجنوبي طبعا ما حد يعني اكيد يستحقون السينما انها تلتفتهم لكن اغلبها ضابط يودع بنته وبعدين هي تصيح وعلم وسارعي في النهايه هذا يمشي في جده في الدمام في برلين وهذا يطلعون احنا نحضر 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 افلام اوكي يجلسون في وجده يجلسون في وجده لكن افلام معينه لا على طول اوتوماتيكيا مربوطين ذهنيا انه بروبا كذا اوتوماتيكيا يمشي فبالنهايه هذه مهمه على اساس لان Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode of We Are In This Together. We Are In This Together is an unscripted live non-profit broadcast by Dearborn Blog, hosted by me, your host, Wissam Sharafuddin, to have conversations that become oral history records of our life during the COVID-19 pandemic, also known as the coronavirus pandemic. These are personal stories of our lives during these unprecedented social isolation measures in a globalized world that have brought us together. With me today, my friend Abdul Muhsin Al Mutairi is a Saudi film and direct film director and film critic who has directed and produced over 20 short feature and documentary films, including the award-winning Sunrise Sunset and Daesh Girl. He is currently working at Aramco as a film director and living in uh, Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Abdul, to the We Are In This Together. Thank you. Thank you, Shukran Wissam. And uh, I'm glad to have this uh, uh, interview with you and uh, with your uh, great audience. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, uh, we, when we, ha we will have to talk about uh, you as a film director, uh, although uh, We Are In This Together is focused on the personal stories of us as humans, basically living in different parts of the world during this pandemic. So uh, most of the uh, episode will focus <clears throat> on your personal uh, story and, and, and the reflection of your environment. So <laughs> we're trying to have uh, guests from different parts of the world to reflect <clears throat> the different uh, ways people are living this pandemic. That is also in a way the same way uh, as everyone. Uh, so, uh, but before we get to the personal uh, story, we have to uh, talk a little bit about you as a film director. Uh, and we have the pleasure of having you really with us uh, in a very special time in Saudi Arabia. So just a brief uh, uh, background. Um, 
the 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 cinema in Saudi Arabia has is a new thing. It started in 2018 uh, when the cinema theater was officially allowed to open at the commercial level. Uh, there are many movie theaters in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but they are situated only in main cities like uh, Khobar, Riyadh, and Jeddah, and so on. Uh, there were no cinemas in Saudi Arabia from 1983 to 2018, although there was occasionally talk of opening movie theaters. And in 2008, conference rooms were rented to show the comedy uh, Minahi. <clears throat> Saudis wishing to watch films have done so via satellite, DVD, or video. Of course, uh, people still find found ways, of course, to engage in cinema. But uh, as officially in Saudi Arabia, there was no uh, cinema life. In 2018, as part of the Saudi Vision 2030 initiative and toward achieving quality of life programs goal, Saudi Arabia began to authorize the construction of new cinemas for the first time in 35 years. Until the first cinema in Saudi Arabia opened on 18th of April 2018 in Riyadh, AMC Theatres plans to open up to 40 cinemas in some 15 Saudi cities over the following five years. In January, just this uh, last, not uh, 2020, the one before it, January 2019, the first cinema theatre was opened in Jeddah, the commercial capital of uh, Saudi Arabia. Kif al Hal, uh, released in 2006, was billed as Saudi Arabia's first film. However, it was shot in the United Arab Emirates and the lead. Uh, female was played by a Jordanian. The 2012 film, uh, uh, Waj, Waj, how do you say it, Abdul? Uh, Waj, Wajda? Wajda? Uh, Wajja? Mm -hmm. How do you say it? Wajda? Sahih. Wajda. Wajda. Because I don't know why. Wajda. The... Wajda. Yeah, I... Wajda. Okay. Nah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the English nah. spelling is confusing. Uh, uh, the 2012 Wajda film had an all Saudi cast and was the first feature film shot entirely in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the film Bak uh, Baraka Yuqabil Baraka, Baraka meets Baraka, director Mahmoud Sabah was shot in Jeddah in 2015, premiered in 66th Berlin International Film Festival, making it the first Saudi film feature to participate in festival. Samira Aziz is the first Saudi filmmaker in Indian cinema, uh, Bollywood. This is a little background of the uh, current uh, situation in Saudi Arabia that is uh, the, the, the uh, you know, a flourishing uh, market right now for cinema. And Abdul, you've been there uh, before that as a, as, a, as a filmmaker, so it must be very exciting times for you. That's right. And uh, excited, exciting time to my generation as a filmmaker because uh, if we go back to a timeline before... Uh, before the Jahayman period in the Iranian revolution, which has, which as I call it, a turning point to shut down the cinema in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, because that's what time in uh, what we call it Sahwa in the eighties. That's the time when the cinema are closed, been closed actually by the Saudi authorities uh, to be aligned with the, the mood back then, because the mood back then was more about Ummat uh, al-Islam, uh, meaning uh, uh, people start to be uh, anti anything uh, that was westernized. Now, uh, as, as you mentioned, as I work in Aramco, I, I realized something very important. They have very big archive and very old films that shot in the 30s and 40s in Saudi Arabia. That's meant to be documentary about exploration of oil production in Saudi Arabia. And they built actually a movie theater in Bahran area in Khobar, that's in Eastern Saudi Arabia, to screen that film for a specialist in engineering for uh, oil production and investors to learn about, uh, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, explored. Now that's, that step from Aramco, uh, 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 carried out by the society in the 60s and 70s, uh, which means we have small theaters that used to play movies, mostly Egyptian movies, the classical Egyptian movies, uh, in the roof of the buildings, and sometimes roof of the clubs, uh, soccer clubs. They, have, they call it like uh, small uh, art house uh, movie theaters. It's commercial, but you have to buy tickets very, like, very, very old style. You just sit and 
you, you don't have a, like a Coca-Cola or something like that, like you have it in San Francisco in the 60s. Popcorn. Uh, or popcorn, like now. But it, I think you just, just sit and chill and just uh, have a hookah or something. Uh, after Jehaiman, which is, I think it's important period to understand why this cinema is not there, uh, the, uh, the general thinking and official thinking are shifts to absorb, absorb the uh, conservative uh, uh, phenomenon back then. And then uh, the resultant by shut down the cinema. Now in, in the 90s, which is very important period, uh, uh, this, Saudi Arabia start allowing uh, movies to be screened in uh, TV channels like NBC, Rotana, uh, and LBC, and uh, some, some Egyptian uh, channels, and allowing also movies and cinema to be talked talk about it in newspaper, which is that I think it's been uh, uh, concentrated in King Abdullah period, which is he considered to be moderate, uh, uh, moderate uh, figure, to the to the same timeline which is uh, allowing the path for the new government to allow the cinema i think which is i think it's uh, you know it's it's exciting time to us uh, because we never even dreamed to have uh, movie theaters now we have it and um, uh, i'm glad of course yeah. great uh, it looks it looks like there is a little delay between me and you so we'll we'll work through that uh, yep. Uh, we're glad for this technology that's uh, made it possible. Um, Abdul, so uh, today is, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, for the record, it's May 3rd, uh, 2020. Uh, the world has a confirmed uh, 3.46 million cases of uh, COVID-19, recovered 1.11 million, and uh, total deaths of 245,000. In the uh, United States, where I live, uh, there is 1.17 million confirmed cases, recovered 152,000, and deaths 67,300. And in Michigan, specifically where I live, there is 43,207 cases and deaths about 4,020. Michigan has a population of about uh, between 9 to 10 million uh, people. Uh, what is the situation in Saudi Arabia today uh, with uh, COVID-19? It's relatively almost the same. Uh, we have a population, it's about 29 uh, million uh, people. That include expats and uh, some uh, uh, visitors uh, that's trapped in Saudi Arabia during the lockdown. And we have 26,000 uh, uh, cases, confirmed cases. Uh, and the death rate is super low um, compared to Europe and uh, United States. And that I think it's explained by the um, generation in Saudi Arabia, mostly below 30. I think that's, that could explain it. Uh, perhaps another reason I would argue in some uh, medical uh, articles that I've been reading that argue uh, that there's uh, the, uh, desert and bad weather in Saudi Arabia allowing the lung to be uh, perform and be uh, more stronger uh, than clean weather. Maybe, maybe it's a case. Uh, there is some uh, another reasons, but um, uh, the, the lifestyle also is very important. Most Saudis uh, drive cars and live like in their, uh, their own house, not like, uh, for example, Italy, where people are walking a lot and gathering a lot and hang out a lot. So it could be uh, the third reason. Now it's devastating, it's depressing. I'm not lying to you. I'm not saying, uh, wow, I'm using uh, this time to build up my new talent or my uh, skills. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we uh, do some reading and, and you know, watching some documentaries and movies and uh, gathering with the families. But it's, it's just, to me, change even not my perspective about my life and myself. Change the whole, questioning the whole, uh, the, the whole system in general, like uh, economic system and uh, political system in the world. And uh, it's it's unbelievable time that a hidden uh, virus uh, hit, hit all the economy, uh, economics. Uh, uh, and I, I've been critical to the uh, capital, uh, capital uh, 
capitalism uh, for a long time. So mm -hmm. I think I, I might be biased, but I think uh, a small cases, a, a small things like this hitting hard to the many ac major economies that allow us to open questions to uh, uh, is the money important or the human? Is the mind important or the machine? Is it this? It is profit. Uh, is a war important or peace? Is it? Is it? Is it? A lot of questions need to be opened, but now we have to focus on what we have. So, uh, for as you as your personal life, did it? How did it affect your uh, your work, your schedule? In my work, uh, because I work in uh, Aramco, which is uh, one of the main uh, player in uh, in the economy, I, I go to work. Uh, but uh, they reduce the hours, but I have to go to work. My personal time with Sam, يعني, it's unbelievable. Like, I cannot see my mother, I, can, I cannot see my friends. I live to travel. I go, like, just last year, I went to four countries alone uh, in 2019. I just love to just sometimes just uh, go to quick trips for three days in Cairo or something. Uh, that's to be uh, not available at the moment. Uh, it has a very negative uh, side in my in my uh, thinking. Yani, because sometimes even if you want to write something, you want to write story or screenplay or develop a, a film. Sometimes if you forced to stay home, you cannot. You cannot. It, it just you can't. So, yeah, it, it changes the mood. So as a as a filmmaker, um, uh, this this question comes to mind uh, almost to everyone. Like, are we gonna be able to produce new films? Are we gonna have like a a, a desert during two thousand twenty where where new films are not made? How is it? How is the cinema industry reacting to this? Well, it's one of the major uh, business core that's hit uh, very hard. Except uh, uh, online platform like Netflix and Apple uh, and Amazon and uh, uh, platforms like this, they actually uh, get more uh, subscribe, uh, but they don't have uh, time to produce new uh, episodes and new films, which is will be critical because if they show the same materials over and over again, they will lose uh, uh, people to to buy uh, their products. Movies, uh, studios, uh, dramatic, uh, very dramatic time to them, because think about it: they, the movie budget are eight, uh, eighty to a hundred million dollar, and they expect them to get that return within three, four months to be able to run, to keep the machine going, because they have thousands of workers, they have uh, rents, they have uh, machines all over the, not just uh, California, but in Georgia, New York. And all over the place, even mm -hmm. in India, there is a there is small studios that do the coloring or the sound. It's very dramatic, uh, not just uh, all uh, only for uh, movie theater, but uh, for TV show as well. Because because the movie because these the movie industry uh, that and the main ones specifically like the Hollywood, Bollywood, etc., they rely on uh, the wide release in movie theaters, right, for their income. exactly. Exactly, so, but there yeah. are there are another type of uh, film and shows now which are produced by the subscription-based companies like Netflix or Amazon, etc. Uh, and they don't really rely on wide release, right? They just uh, rely on the subscription and and investors really in uh, in uh, in their in their platform. So is this going to shift the type of industry into more uh, online streaming? Production rather than Hollywood production is it how is how do you see the effect is going to be? Uh, not much to be honest. I think once this uh, thing go away, uh, people will start go to back to movie theaters because I always believe movie theaters it will stay forever. Uh, mm -hmm. We like we have VHS back in like in the eighties. People start st still going A DVD. We have streaming uh, services. We have. Uh, movie theater to me, it's like music concert. You can listen to music in your home, even from radio since the 20s. Uh, you can listen it uh, from your uh, uh, 
car but you you go you go and listen life people like people program to be uh, like a, in an interactive environment uh, gathering as a group and watch a movie uh, one movie together is going to change the uh, how is the how is the platform is working yes i think disney now is starting building uh, st streaming uh, surfaces and some studios will uh, i think they will uh, yani, uh, they've been attacking netflix now they go on to rethink again no is there is there any people making movies right now very few uh, as you as you know there is only few cities uh, in the world right now uh, not hit uh, at least dramatically uh, by the cases uh -huh. In that cities, uh, let's say in Denmark or some part of India, uh, uh, some I think some degree in the uh, United States, uh, they have what they call it very calculated uh, measures of filmmaking, meaning uh, all the crew, uh, they separated from each other, they shot what they can do, uh, they do the coloring separately, they do the editing separately, they do all the process. Before, you have like maybe 10 people in the room in editing suites because they have six or seven uh, screen at the same time one mm -hmm. guy do the mixing one guy do the dialogue one guy do uh, supervise all the guys and something like that but now they have uh, of course to keep the machine running i, I arguably there is 30 percent people uh, start uh, start uh, working on the critical show and films that's already committed to contracts or to mm -hmm. the audience promise or something like that because you know many industries have turned into remote working and remote models, but uh, that's not possible for the cinema industry, right? I agree. Yeah. That's even even time. to work. Sometimes, yeah. as you know, you know we also work together. Sometimes you just want to sit and interact and engage, like in the real uh, real life. You want to grab a coffee. You want to you want to just it's uh, working in a real life way like uh, productive in my opinion than online yes online can shorten uh, shortcut some uh, some assignments i agree but in uh, in uh, essential work in the planning and uh, not only in the movie theater uh, to me uh, i think in general you need you need to just go and meet people i think yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, Abdul, so uh, as far as uh, uh, Ramadan is concerned, Ramadan Kareem to you and to, and to your family, uh, uh, this is a time, I know this is this is usually as far as Mecca and uh, Medina, يعني, as far as Hijaz, uh, this, uh, this time is busier than even Hajj, you know, uh, especially the last 10 days of Ramadan, and now it's, uh, it's, it's empty. Uh, also, uh, this is a very social country. Uh, the families are big, and they gather together for iftar. There is diwaniyat. You know, there is the gathering salons, especially in Ramadan. Uh, how is how is people reacting to this um, to to this isolation? Oh, very, very, uh, very. It's a sad, very sad situation. Uh, imagine before the decision was made back in, uh, I think, two months from now, when it's uh, the country was shut down, there is about 5,000 people came to see a Kaaba for the first time in their life. And they never seen it before, except in the cell phones or the, in the TV. And then when they arrived, uh, there is a talk that we have to send them back, but the Saudi government allowed them to uh, see the Mecca for uh, last time, to do, give them like very special treatment and allowed them to visit uh, Mecca and Medina. Uh, and beside that, not just visiting, uh, uh, watching uh, even, uh, because I spend Ramadan all, uh, most of the times in Saudi Arabia, watching sometime in uh, family gathering, uh, Mecca uh, praying, it's very like become like part of Ramadan, uh, like style. It's very cool to listen to uh, Quran and enjoy the uh, scene where people just uh, concentrated and. Uh, mm -hmm. Practicing uh, to Kaaba and, and the rituals of Ramadan and uh, yeah, mm. very rich, very rich in many aspects. Now the economy, the economy is very hit. Uh, Saudi Arabia, it's uh, uh, not only the economy of Saudi Arabia. People of Mecca and Medina rely heavily on visitors uh, uh, to sell them uh, their product, to rent them their house or hotels or small apartments. Uh, very devastating time to them, and I think it will be gradually because Mecca and Medina is so super uh, essential to uh, image of Saudi Arabia to be uh, uh, one of the 
leading country uh, of Islam. I think it's uh, it will be a gradual opening for uh, some degree of people to allow them to do the tawaf and do uh, you know some like some people with a camera you can you can make them like look like the crowded people and something like that. All right, we'll go to some of our uh, questions, uh, Abdul. For you, we have a question from uh, Alex uh, Sharafuddin. He says, "What are some of the things you are accomplishing staying at home during the COVID nineteen pandemic?" Uh, I think something like uh, participating in what you do, uh, Wissam, to be honest. Uh, I've been engaging in many uh, platforms and uh, online uh, uh, chat and workshop and doing some uh, training uh, sessions to uh, young filmmakers and uh, screenwriters. Um, do some reading, to be honest. Uh, I, uh, to be uh, completely uh, honest with myself, I haven't done uh, much reading in the past few years. Uh, I think in the United States period, because I was studying another books, which is uh, huge. But back home, I was promised myself to finish at least one book every month. But as you know, with Sam, you read some book and you next you jump to another. And it's just, yeah. but yeah, uh, and with, you, with your like, line of work, Yanni, it's, you have a very that's social that's time. Uh, you have, you're engaged socially and uh, it's very exciting times. When, when uh, the more socially engaged you are, the less time you have to read. Uh, so America is kind of different in that sense, but, but I get what you mean, both in Lebanon or uh, there is a lot more friends, there's a lot more social interaction, there's a lot more family. So I get it that it, it would be hard for you after coming back from the United States to maintain your reading uh, habits. One thing, Wissam, I think I, I, I forgot the word in Arab in English, but I think, uh, mashallah, you are very good in English. But the ta'amul, mm -hmm. uh, absorbing, like uh, the ta'amul is very good. Mindfulness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just, uh, just you, you, you force to sit home for hours, and sometimes ta'amul and mind uh, thinking allow you to uh, clean up uh, your. Uh, and and touch uh, areas in your mind, uh, clear uh, clear up your uh, mindful and be thoughtful about some things. Mm. Uh, did you learn? Did about... you learn meditation, Abdul? That's that's once this is done, I will do it. Like beside yoga, I will do it all over the place. Where 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 did you learn meditation? When when did you first practice meditation? Uh, uh, in, in, uh, when I when I moved to United States, uh, my neighbor uh, was uh, very good at it, and uh, in Oregon uh, before Philadelphia, I was in Oregon for a year, one year, mm -hmm. to uh, to study English mm -hmm. in a small town called Ashland, very lovely town, uh, allow you to just uh, absorb the landscape and yeah. just enjoy it. And my neighbor actually, uh, she doing. Uh, uh, her pract uh, practice, uh, like sometime in the garden, sometime at her home, sometime in the schoolyard. And it's uh, in my friend uh, back in Saudi Arabia also, she's doing uh, sound uh, techniques, uh, which is very cool uh, tactics. And she's uh, she's a great, uh, Japanese uh, teacher. Uh, to be honest, it's very little. I have to engage more now. <laughs> Great. It's nice how to, you know, how uh, how civilizations, they, uh, um, you know, they polonize each other, uh, you know. So you went to Oregon, you learned meditation. Now you're in Saudi Arabia. You probably teach it to someone there. And this is uh, the beauty of traveling, uh, right? Uh, yes. And how we are all connected in one way or another. Um, yes. So, uh, uh, is there anything at the film level you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, this all of a sudden you have a lot of uh, extra time. Is there something that you thought to yourself, you know what, since I have this extra time, now I'm going to try to accomplish this? Mainly to uh, uh, clean up and, uh, and make cook more uh, about my. Uh, I have two uh, uh, feature uh, screenplay, long one, and I have one short film. Uh, both, uh, I've been working on them. Uh, the first, the long one, for two years. Uh, for the short film, I've been working on it for uh, three months now. Now, in this period, it's allowed me to, again, to look look at uh, at the, my screenplay and my characters 
more deeply, more thoughtful, and uh, uh, evaluate it very thoughtfully and engage with it uh, in an honest way and how to want to accomplish with my character, through my characters and through my story. And it's, uh, it's uh, actually, it's uh, the, lo the feature uh, screenplay, it's a story took, uh, place, uh, took place in the desert, actually, by three uh, female uh, women, t Saudi women teachers going to their, uh, their school and they get lost, which is a very perfect time in our period now because uh, it's allowed me to go deep with their characters, to invest more in uh, how they behave with each other, how they confront death and life and love and something like that. Interesting. I have a question from Hanan Yahya. She says, um, how, how do you develop yourself or heal yourself? Uh, I think uh, I, I realized in the past, like in the, in the, in the, in the past, uh, let's say, uh, years, uh, that's not trying. Uh, if you try to achieve something that you have passionate of, of it and you can't, then don't. That's, that's my uh, strategy at the moment. Uh, I just let my passion to guide me and just uh, allowing myself to, whenever something that uh, forced me to do something, it means something to develop me to do it, not the other way around, meaning I'm not developing myself to force myself to be, for example, a TV writer, if you know what I mean. If I don't have a passionate about it, just let go. Uh, mm -hmm. Healing myself, I think, uh, you know me, Sam. I just completely honest with myself and always seeking for the truth, seeking for uh, two perspectives all the time, seeking for uh, um, uh, uh, very independent thinking versus the conventional thinking. Mm -hmm. Always, always uh, uh, study, study things from different perspectives. Uh, that's very healing to me. Yeah. Yeah, I know you, uh, Abdul, your, your attitude is amazing. You're always open to uh, ideas. You're never confrontational. Uh, uh, you're one of the people, uh, one of the most people I know that do not really uh, 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 feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, stubborn about their opinion or, you know, always open-minded, you know, uh, very open-minded. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Adnan Jaber. How are we going to remind ourselves about the lessons we learned during this pandemic? So before we, we ask this question, maybe we ask, what are some of the lessons that you have learned from this pandemic? Oof. <laughs> uh, just to be humble. It's it's very good lesson for a human being to just uh, allow ourselves to... We have to good lesson to concentrate on uh, human itself to not just not just everything for sale or for profit or like we have like big conferences to uh, uh, to build up uh, uh, big uh, uh, big ideas for uh, environmental uh, uh, sessions where there is homeless uh, next to the institutions i i know this is brought brought any uh, provocative uh, mm. way to say it, but we have to just examine everything we do because, uh, like, it doesn't make sense if we just focus on concentrated wealth in some areas for the sake of humanity and we just let go others. We cannot see CNN broadcasting in power in Africa where they have, like, for example, uh, most of the uh, uh, employees have almost 0.1% people, not from Af American, uh, African Americans, only one so uh, from South Africa or something like that. Meaning it's just, we have to rethink about everything we do and be humble and just uh, examine everything, uh, to be honest. Yeah. And how are we going to remember these lessons after this is over or we're going to forget this whole thing? Yeah, because this is not a war. This is just devastating for the first time, uh, equal to all economies, all the governments, all the people, all the behaviors, all the social uh, interactions at the same time. This is uh, a new phenomenon that even to me, I'm not even 
uh, be uh, encouraged to describe it uh, at we, as we speak. This is a new thing that uh, we need to, uh, it's not just a wage in a war in the Eastern Front, Eastern Front in Russia somewhere. Russia, ah, yeah, they die. They're confronting German, who cares? They let, we let them kill each other until uh, they both tired and then we intervene from the Western Front. No, this is a different story. They're not a Syrian refugee. Yeah, just a couple of millions uh, that's been killed by a regime that we support. Uh, we, I mean the world, like five countries, the main five power. Right. It's not like Palestini, Palestinians people. Yeah, just a couple of millions in South Af America, America or like in, uh, in Africa. Yeah, they will be fine. It just a couple of people lost their houses. No, this is a different story. This, this is blind from the poor and rich. This is blind from the powerful people all the way to the homeless people. This is blind to all of us. That's why the mainstream uh, establishments are freak out because the first time something are really threatening everyone. And uh, to yeah. me, I'm not like happy about it. I'm just saying we have to be thinking about each other. We have to say we all the time, not I. Right, right. Amazing. Um, question from Kathy Brown from Argentine. Uh, she says, what do you think that the ideal outcome of this pandemic at a personal level and at a collective level? يعني شو النتيجة المثالية على المستوى الشخصي وعلى المستوى الجماعي؟ personal level, good question by the way. We enjoy, uh, we enjoy life. Mm. We don't enjoy life often. We go to a hotel somewhere in the beaches. We just we like hang over and just drink coffee and just sit like inside the house for hours. Now, now we go into walk and drink coffee in the beach and enjoy life, enjoy talking, enjoy each other. Yeah, it's it's in my personal level. This is my our my personal level. I will enjoy everything now. To be honest. Collective, I think what I'm seeking to, it's a collective uh, ch uh, uh, shifting of thinking about how we manage things, how we uh, see each other, how we see the others. I hope this, uh, uh, this thing will allow uh, people in, uh, in charge to, uh, more, uh, to allow them to, to rethink again that it might happen again, like Obama said it before and some president said it and Bill Gates said it before. I hope all politicians now will think this might come again. So they they focus in infrastructures and medical, they focus in uh, Medicare for all, uh, not attacking some people, uh, even in uh, some party, uh, business party, uh, disclude some uh, of the candidates that's uh, thinking of Medicare for all, uh, something like that. We have to just strongly think about it uh, in the deep down and uh, hopefully, uh, more positive things will come. I see that you follow American politics closely. Yeah, I'm interested in American politics more, more than uh, any politics in the world because mm. uh, the world will always follow or influenced by, uh, by the policies uh, mm -hmm. from the United States and arguably from China, the, uh, uh, the economy, uh, not economic policy, the mm. uh, environmental uh, policies. Mm -hmm. But you know, it always uh, ch change behaviors. No. A question, we have a lighter question from a comedian, Amir Zahar. He uh, says, what, what food reminds you of your childhood? Uh, food, uh, mostly uh, fruits, to be honest. Because, you uh, your childhood? Because <laughs> you stopped eating food. them when you became an adult, yeah? <laughs> when I when I start uh, crawling and start to remember that I am a human, because as you know, if you like a month years old or all the way to year and a half, you don't you don't you don't think you just you just hanging there. But once I think I'm two years or three years, I start crawling, uh, you walk in a lot and see some fruits and eat them. And I think mm -hmm. that's the first scene that. Mind you, of your childhood. Uh -huh. Any specific yeah. fruit? What's your favorite fruit? Uh, apple, easy to eat, I think, back then, and yeah. uh, arguably orange uh, as far as I remember, but apple, it's easy, it's easy to carry, easy, even even if it's dirty, you can eat it, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you, do you, 
you know what? I I miss uh, the humba, the mangoes, in uh, in, in the Gulf area. I I grew up in Emirat in the United Arab Emirates, and uh, they get their uh, mangoes from Pakistan and, and India and Sri Lanka, and, and it's very sweet. So I miss that uh, over there. Yeah, I love it. We have a question from Hadil Dube, a musician from New York. He says, "What's the last epiphany or aha moment that you had?" يعني في حدث في هيك صحوة. I think uh, when uh, when primaries uh, candidates uh, last year, uh, last uh, elections, I think this is the shocking uh, shocking point to me. When Bernie lost. No, no, no. The primary uh, for 2016. Oh, okay. Well, the final, the finalist, when uh, Hillary and uh, Donald declared declared as uh, as the final. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was given, I was in uh, a light of hope when I moved to the United States in, back in 2010, when Obama get elected. Uh, I have some doubts, uh, some ag disagreement about his policies, especially in the Middle East. Uh, with the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, for example, but he 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 representing hope. He's representing a new generation. He representing he he's a, he's smart. At least there is some uh, progression in the United States uh, policies. But when I realized that these two candidates are the finalists, I was like, I'm giving up. Uh, back then, I was devastated uh, position. Um, what 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 kind of uh, result يعني, you had from that moment? I just uh, I just realized that it's just a business uh, business show. To be honest with you, I'm, I, I, I was I was in the hope that it will be uh, there is a glance of uh, a real uh, democratic. Uh, uh, process when uh, first time in in, in history uh, a candidate from the two mainstream uh, get uh, get in a run and uh, when when the when actually the party who should support to represent him uh, attack him and disclude him from the race uh, i was giving up i was like it's clear it's just a, it's a, just a game we mm. in it it's just coca cola and pepsi yeah. <laughs> it's it's it's, uh, it's the worst time that I've been in it to be to be in a time that it's it's supposed to be uh, uh, there is a glimpse of hope that yeah. it's very uh, disappointing this is the second time we get disappointed too I mean we had the dream candidate really uh, as far as Bernie Sanders yeah and, uh, no matter what you know the details of his economic policy we might have some differences but in general, just a, a solid politician, not flip-flopping, a man with values, very uh, consistent on his values, um, uh, a person for the people, for total health care, for a free education, a person with a foreign policy that will basically be a, a revolution in the world, a transformation uh, of the globe into a peaceful globe. You know, drastically, like uh, 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 a shortcut towards world world peace. Uh, I mean, given all the challenges within the American administration, because it's not not everything is about the president, right? Uh, he has to yeah. uh, struggle to make his, his to draw his way through the administration, but but uh, ultimately he will have an, a big influence on world peace. For the first time, we have an honest. Candidate about the Palestinian American, uh, uh, I mean the Palestinian Israeli uh, conflict, because uh, the the uh, colonization of Palestine, that's uh, a British project sponsoring Israel, has been taken over by the United States. So the United States has become the uh, colonizing sponsoring power of uh, of Israel. And uh, for once, we had a glimpse of hope that uh, the conversation will be uh, balanced. Uh, a serious uh, talk about peace will be on the table. And it disappeared. Uh, and we're back to square one. We're back to this commercialism. And, you know, 60% of the youth was with him. So this is a disappointment for America's youth. 
Um, I think uh, I, I'm still hopeful that this will motivate more Afghan. Uh, but I mean, I feel like in my lifetime, it's, that opportunity is gone. Uh, it will be another 10, 20 years to get something solid uh, on the table again. Uh, you know, I've uh, throughout my stay in the United States, I've been voting for the Green Party. As an yeah, American. stop. And I completely understand your uh, position. Yeah, and the only time I didn't is I voted for Obama because he was a, vote, a voice of hope. Well, Obama was a good improvement, but he wasn't really, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what we hoped for, right? Uh, yeah. He didn't occupy new countries, but if he, he's uh, multiplied by folds and folds of time the drone attacks on civilians, the, uh, the bias towards Israel, what did not change. That's it. We're not going to switch this into politics now because, <laughs> because uh, we won't end. So a question from Hadi Shatila. What is the worst thing COVID-19 pandemic made you discover about yourself? Let's see. Uh, let's see how honest you are, uh, <laughs> Abdul. Well, I fear of death. Mm. That's, the, that's the honest things I can uh, imagine. Because... Because this is the this is the serious thing. Uh, it's not uh, just uh, hurting some people who have existing condition. It's uh, it could harm everyone, uh, and not not just me. It's I, the the idea that I can because I forced to go to work because I work in oil uh, oil and gas company that's as I, I I make films for them. I every day I come home. I have three kids, and one of them he's like. Like four months, five months. Yeah, and I mean, you can just imagine how I can just deal with my family and every day. It's kind of horrifying to just an idea that you can transmit something that could harm your loved one. It's just I can I can take it, but uh, the idea of someone else take it from you. Yeah, I always tell my coworkers this funny to change their dramatic uh, mood. I always said I'm not uh, afraid of uh, uh, first line and war because you can see the missile come to you. You can you can just die. Like, sure, yeah, at once. <laughs> this is hard because it's you never know. Like, is it what? How? Uh, what's the percentage where I just touch things? It's just annoying. <laughs> yeah, it is annoying. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've I've. I don't fear death. I just fear leaving my kids orphans. That's the only thing I have, I'm afraid of death is that it's going to hurt my kids. So when they're like 18, 19 years old, I'm fine then, you know? But when they're children, they need me and it's not fair not to fear death uh, for them, you know? Uh, <clears throat> we have the opposite question from uh, <clears throat> Talal Matar from Kuwait. <clears throat> says, what is the best thing COVID-19 pandemic made you discover about yourself? Well, just uh, faith uh, of uh, human, faith about yourself, faith about uh, a spiritual uh, uh, backdoor to you, not just sciences sometimes. You have to just uh, rethink about your uh, beliefs, you rethink about uh, your thinking. Uh, to be honest, i always honest with myself. I always, all of the way from the right uh, uh, spectrum to the left. I always believe sometime even in uh, some crazy ideas. Sometime in, you have to just go back to basic and just uh, realize you, uh, you have to just manage uh, your uh, deep thoughtful thinking by yourself and go back to, uh, go to back to uh, just some, some beliefs. So you, you feel that the best thing that it made you discover about yourself that you have you had some spiritual spirituality uh, that you can go back to. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's very it's very uh, uh, good to know that ignoring the idea of you going back to some uh, uh, spiritual beliefs, but you just keep ignoring it and just be practical, rational all the time. You know, it's just uh, recognize 
you're in, in that path at least is in, in the right way to me. As, as you know, I always not trying to develop things. I let the wave uh, control me. Uh, thank you, Abdul, for uh, beautiful answers, really. Uh, we want to get some recommendations from you uh, for our audience, and this is a habit. And at the end, you're going to add a question that's going to become part of the questions that we ask everyone. So uh, before we go there, there are three films I want to ask you to give me your opinion about. And you're going to give me your opinion about in just you know, a few words, like say one sentence about them. Okay, first of all, uh, Baraka and the Baraka. Mar Baraka meets Baraka. Provocative, important to go under life of uh, urban cities in Saudi Arabia. Do you recommend it? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another film. Taban, this is kind of uh, a given. This is uh, probably, you would say, maybe one of the best films made in Saudi Arabia. Wajda? A masterpiece. One of the best uh, films made uh, in the uh, eastern uh, side of the uh, Middle East. Really? Uh, it's arguably the best film in GCC uh, cinema. Awesome. <coughs> And <clears throat> one more, I'll take your opinion about, and your opinion is very important. Kef uh, al-Hal. Commercial, very uh, flatly made, uh, worst of time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's got three, <laughs> it's got three uh, stars. Uh, it deserved it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now, what is what is the last film you've watched, and what film do you recommend? Uh, the last, the last, uh, the last movies uh, I watched. It's uh, uh, it's a show actually, a Spanish uh, show called uh, The Professor. Uh, and also, I watch a very important documentary called uh, called uh, Food Inc. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the the movie I recently uh, highly recommend. It's uh, it's called uh, uh, American Dream by uh, Naom Chomsky. I think people who uh, not interested to his uh, uh, talks, uh, this movie will trigger a lot of uh, thoughts mm -hmm. uh, global wise and uh, some uh, key ideas uh, that's the movie i nowadays i really recommend because it's impact many things that he's been talk about it for decades uh, now it's it's become true in some some elements of the movie um is it how do you know how old is it is it a new film or it's uh, it's uh, uh, relatively new. I I will uh, I will send you uh, uh, the the link right now. But he has very very limited uh, films. Uh, so if you type it in Google, uh, if you type his name in IMDb, for example, you will yeah. find this movie in his latest. Okay. Because the good thing is about the filmmakers, they they trying to show his talks with images and it's super uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember seeing part of it. Okay, great. So Abdul recommends a documentary, American Dream by Naum Komsky. And film, what do you recommend in film? Uh, film, I recommend... Uh, let me let me go to my list <laughs> <laughs> because it's super important now because your audience it's uh, they are elite so i have to pick a very good one uh, mm -hmm. i would recommend a romanian film called uh, for very simple uh, title 
uh, it's showing uh, a woman uh, back in the 80s, uh, back in the Soviet uh, era mm. in uh, Romania, trying to do uh, an illegal abortion. And uh, it will go from there. It's very, very uh, good film. What and uh, oh. back to... Are you looking for it? Uh, what is it? Yeah. Uh, but it's called Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days. Mm. Four yeah. Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> What is uh, what is uh, mu music that you're listening to or uh, that you've discovered lately that you'd like to share with our audience? Ah, oh, this is very good, very tricky because I am uh, I I I'm equally bad with uh, updating myself or upgrading myself of listening to uh, Arabic and Western music. To be honest, but I enjoy really uh, discovering uh, recently. Uh, uh, some different and separated soundtracks by Philip Glass and uh, Hans Zabar, which is these two, and, uh, uh, and also Alex Alexander de Blatt, uh, British uh, uh, composer. These three people, when I start listening to their music alone, without the film, uh, it's just completely this uh, new uh, new journey. That's, I think, because if I recommend, uh, let's say, Najat Sagira or like some uh, folk music in folk. America, I will be in a bad position in your, compared to your audience. <laughs> but uh, these three people, Philip Glass and uh, Philip Glass in, in particular, if you just put the headphones and listen to it and just. This is a piece by Philip Glass. Yeah, this is like an individual assessment where, if it if you listen to it with a uh, like a, a like a it's just unbelievable. Like because it's as you know when we watch a movie, it's, the music is embedded to the emotional parts. So we focus on performance or the story itself, and we can't just uh, ignoring the the background music. But when you take that uh, part alone and just uh, uh, play with it, uh, it's I think it's worth it because when you ask me that uh, uh, that uh, to prepare to uh, put the questions, uh, I realize your audience will be much uh, like I cannot what I'm going to say like Fairuz. <laughs> no, I mean, it's fine because it's personal, right? Like, what does Abdul listen to, you know? Uh, but it's interesting that as a filmmaker, you're interested in people who create soundtracks. Something uh, yeah, that I, don't I, I'm, a, I'm a classical. I, I enjoy uh, I enjoy and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like Fayrouz and Najat Sagira and uh, all, all like back in like the 70s. So, uh, by the way, in filmmaking, people don't pay attention much to the music uh, and, the, and the, the music maker, the music producer of the of the of the show. And usually, it's it's an important part of the of the film, right? Uh, I've discovered that uh, I discovered that in two ways. One way is when I read about Mustafa Al Aqad in making the film, the message, the risala that he struggled to find a, a musician who will create the music, the soundtrack that fits the story, the story of the birth of Islam and the story of Prophet Muhammad. So he uh, he struggled to find the right, the, يعني, with all the directors, with all the musicians that are uh, in the Arabic world, we could not really find someone who can really represent the uh, depth of the, of the story. And he uh, uh, resorted to a French uh, musician who created the the music that we all of us uh, associate with Islam now, right? Yeah. So, um, he created that music. So 
at that point, I realized how important is uh, that movie. Yeah. And by the way, he died after he finished the score. So, so lucky enough to have the score ready uh, for the film. And the second time I realized uh, how uh, important is the music is, is uh, there is a film, uh, Born Identity. Yeah. <clears throat> who the, I love the music in it. So I, I bought the soundtrack. It's by uh, Paul, his name. And uh, I started... Love. Sorry? I love that music. Yeah, he used the Indian tabla with the Western uh, instruments. Uh, to show the, the real mood of the film. It's very, very fitting, uh, the film. That in the in the series of the Born, the Born series, the director changed, some actors changed, the story changed, but the musician stayed the same. Uh, and yes. He, and he, and he, he created the consistency in the, in the, in the, in the film uh, through his music. And his music alone by itself, it's half of the scene, you know. So I realize how important as a musician. Do you want to reflect on that as a director? Yeah, a, a very big influential uh, filmmaker, uh, Paul Greengrass. He with uh, Christopher Nolan and uh, Alejandro uh, Gonzalez, the Mexican filmmaker that made, uh, who uh, directed and uh, uh, write, uh, wrote and directed uh, Babel. Uh, the movie that's partially also shot in Morocco, the same city, the same country that uh, shot with Born Ultimate, with the third part of uh, Born series. Mm. Why I mention these three? Because they're very, very careful with music. They ask like thousands of pieces before they uh, put uh, some uh, tracks in their uh, scenes. And to me, it's very, very powerful to to engage with the movie stories because as you remember, back in the days, uh, there was like Egyptian movies, uh, Hollywood uh, movies, that's about Egyptian, uh, like Queen or something. And the music, it's totally Western. And there is, uh, let's say, a movie about Jesus, which is his, uh, as far as I remember, his uh, Middle East ring. But you see, yeah, ignore the fact he's white, but that's fine. But the music is totally <laughs> like England or something. Yeah. And when that's that's what I think it's very powerful of the uh, Mel Gibson uh, cut of the mm -hmm. Palestinians uh, man when he uh, creates uh, an Arabic music because it's it will uh, will allow us to engage more because if we believe in the music we believe in the story. Right. Interesting yeah. uh, book. And uh, I know you probably you said that you you haven't really <clears throat> been engaged with reading, but is there a book that you recommend? I prepare. I prepare for your audience. It's by Ahmed Atif. Uh, uh, I don't know if you see it. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, image, uh, an, an uh, image of Arab in uh, American Cinema by uh, Ahmed Atif, Dr. Ahmed Atif. He's uh, an Egyptian uh, uh, writer. Uh, and uh, the, 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 why, I, why I think uh, I recommend this movie, this uh, book, sorry, because I've been, to be honest, in my like uh, thin uh, interest that's been writing about movies and uh, cinema history, uh, the image of uh, Arabs uh, in the global uh, cinema been uh, been been uh, like in my one of my uh, stronghold areas uh, to invest uh, with, and in this book, he give the good things about this book. He give uh, an example uh, of movies. And thoughtful, very deep, uh, deep uh, analysis. Why? Why? It's, what's the background? Why we? Uh, why they uh, stereotype this character? And it's a very, very thoughtful uh, book. Do you feel that Hollywood has improved ever since in portraying the Middle Eastern man? And and uh, in general, yes. But in comparison with the other uh, minorities group like uh, Native Americans or LGBT or uh, Mexicans or uh, uh, African Americans, it's way less less than uh, mm -hmm. they, they portrayed, uh, let's say, uh, African Americans, which is they deserve a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, equal, almost equal now to, uh, to the dominant uh, race. 
uh, but in, in Arab, no, they, they still uh, failed uh, dramatically in the past uh, few years. They, there is a lot of improvements, but still, mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, uh, you can examine uh, Syriana, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, sometimes they're talking, even the language itself. Uh, he's supposed to be Egyptian, and there is a Lebanese, a Lebanese accent in it. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense. A Pakistani guy talking Arabic, and it's just a mess. Yeah, I see this. I see this, and I feel like offended when I see it. Like a complete carelessness. Uh, yeah. When they speak Arabic, they're assuming that the audience does not speak Arabic. So it doesn't matter. He can just be babbling. Uh, bad translation. There's no attention to details. And it goes back to the director. The director allows it. Like a green, a green grass doesn't allow it. You know, like he's very authentic in his uh, choices. Ben Affleck, ben Affleck in his Argo film. Is mm -hmm. very very careful with the accents of uh, uh, within Tehran uh, region. Of course, Iran there is a lot of uh, people speak different language like Kurds or Arab. But of course, the people who go in to deal with are Persian. So mm -hmm. when I saw that movie, I I was waiting for moments of like some guy saying like uh, like ridiculous like ah oh, come half hummus or something like something like that in Arabic like mm -hmm. uh, خلاص, خلاص, or something like that like stupid. Uh, like a, a flat guy saying in the background like uh, some ridiculous words, but none of this happened. That's why it's very uh, critical acclaimed movie. Yeah, yeah. Ben Affleck is very, very respect, uh, respectful when it comes to these things. Uh, Abdel Mohsen, it has uh, unfortunately come to the end of our program. Uh, we've went over a few minutes because it has been an interesting discussion. Uh, we are happy to have you with us uh, today here. We thank you for your time. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, you and your family and everyone in Saudi Arabia and the whole world uh, will be safe and uh, um, you know, healthy, both physically and mentally, during this uh, tough times together. And hopefully we'll come out of it more wise and more connected. Um, any final word? Uh, uh, Wissam, I would love uh, to, yeah, I need to give you a big thank about this uh, plat amazing platform. I will big hi to the community and the whole Michigan and the Arab community and the Middle Eastern community and ally uh, uh, back uh, back in the United States. I will uh, would uh, like to uh, be grateful in this moment to be in your show, and I will. I would I would encourage myself and listen uh, the people who are uh, seeing us us to uh, to also whenever we uh, also we critical about ourselves and our time also uh, start building up uh, our uh, collective uh, uh, spirits and uh, rational uh, human thinking and uh, I think we human experience worse uh, events than this so We'll, we will be come over this together, inshallah. We'll overcome it. Thank you for the positive and inspiring words. Uh, and thank you for all you, that you do for the sake of the Arab cinema. We know that this is a topic that we haven't talked about, but we are in great need of people like you, directors, uh, music producers, actors, all experts in the, in the movie and film industry because it is the language of today and we have a big uh, disadvantage in it. The Saudi uh, cinema market has given us amazing films in its very short uh, time. So we thank the Saudi uh, youth innovation and uh, creativity um, led by people like you. And uh, for our audience, thank you for following us. And you can uh, hear this episode on our podcast. Uh, at Dearborn Blog, and also it will be available on the website dearbornblog.com, on YouTube, and on uh, uh, Facebook. And uh, by the way, uh, Abdul's email website, <clears throat> if you want to follow him, is that correct, Abdul? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Abdul's, it's it's W, right? If you two use in the. Yes, correct. Okay. This is uh, Abdul's website if you want to follow him or be in touch with him. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Shukran. Thank you for uh, everyone.